crafting journey here that journey chick on Instagram I feel like it's the middle of the night I'm up early this is my work day got to go into the office well I work every day but this is the day I actually go physically like put on real clothes not pajamas and I go into the office to make sure the phones are covered do you know how many times the phones ring once maybe twice and it's usually for me anyway um <laughs> and my voicemails go directly to my email so I, it stymies me why i need to be physically in this office anywho uh that's where i'm going today and so i'm trying to get some of my other things done this morning and <laughs> yay happy thursday everybody yay so uh, we got through hump day yesterday. The weekend's almost here. Um, tomorrow you'll see the Friday dance. <laughs> and still working on Alice Lost. I'm doing her face. I just put put her, I'm putting on her makeup. We just put on some rouge. Yes, a little rouge. Um, <laughs> do people still call it that? Blush, blush, yes. We put on some blush. Where did I get rouge from? I guess that's what we, that's what I always called it back in the day. Anyway, it's April Fool's Day. Happy April 1st, everybody, 2021. Um, today, we're going to talk about some famous pranks in history later on in the show. But yeah, you know, and this goes way back in history, this April Fool's Day, probably back into the... 1700s um, that it originated you know when they changed to the Gregorian calendar um, the old calendar April 1st was the beginning of the year the Gregorian calendar January 1st was the beginning of the year but a lot of people didn't know that that there had been a switch so they were still celebrating the the new year in April well guess what April Fools it's not the new year January was the new year anyway that was, that's kind of sort of the history of April Fool's Day. I'm not a huge prankster. Um, I can't, you know, at off the top of my head recall any pranks that I pulled on anybody on April 1st, but I'm sure I have. <laughs> um, I just don't remember them. How funny. So we're going to finish her blush here. It's these X's, and they didn't give me very many drills, so we have to be judicious with the drills. So uh, let's get right into Judge, Jury, and Journey. Journey. So we had several uh, witnesses yesterday. They finished up with the firefighter paramedics, which uh, I, I thought they had finished that the day before. What I did not realize um, was, until I watched some of the commentary, was that after um, her testimony on Tuesday, day two of the trial, the firefighter, the judge admonished her for arguing with him. And like, he just said, you will not argue with this court. And when you come back tomorrow, you better be respectful. I mean, and she was still arguing with him. I was trying to finish my question. He's like, I will decide when your answer is finished. Uh, oh yeah, she said, I was trying to finish my answer. He says, I am the one will, that will decide when your answer is finished. <laughs> and you will not argue with me. I felt like, ooh, yes, sir. And that's what she did. She's like, ooh, yes, sir. So I, I suspect that she did not want to go to jail. <laughs> so 
<laughs> so she she uh, said uh, yes. So then she came comes in yesterday morning, sits on the stand, got her uniform on again, and they asked her like three questions, and that they were done. I don't know. I don't know why they didn't finish that the day before. So then they bring on the sales clerk for the cup food uh, establishment where this all began. And this sales clerk, um, young guy, um, he says, you know, there's usually four or five workers plus the manager in there. And um, there is cameras, surveillance cameras inside of the of the establishment. So then we got to see video of the inside of Cup Foods. We got to see George Floyd coming in, you know, milling about, talking to this woman who we um, find out later is his ex-girlfriend. Um, and he, he's just acting weird. He's just kind of like wandering around, doing these goofy dances, like really goofy, like, I can't even describe them. Not Carlton, nothing like that. Just goofy dances. Um, <laughs> so then he wanders over to the tobacco counter and purchases a pack of cigarettes. And you see the sales clerk like holding up the bill to the light. And he was asked, you know, what were you checking for? He says like, well, I was checking to see if it was a good, you know, if it was, counterfeit and he did he said I did suspect it was because it had like this bluish tint to it he says but you know what I I felt sorry for the guy because I don't think he really knew that it was counterfeit so I went ahead and took it now their store policy is that if you take a counterfeit bill it comes out of your paycheck so he had like some second thoughts he's like mm, you yeah, know maybe I don't want this to come out of my paycheck so he goes to his manager tells his manager and his manager says, um, and, you know, he said, you know, he's still outside because, you know, he's, and they said, well, how'd you know that? And he goes, because I watched him walk over to his vehicle. So um, his manager said, well, go out there and get him and tell him to come in and talk to me. So he and another store employee, and there's video of all this, you can see them, they walk out to the vehicle. And instead of going to the driver's side where, and George Floyd is sitting in the driver's side, they, they go to the other side because the driver's side was, um, you know, if they, if they had stood there, they would be risking, you know, getting hit by a car. And the driver's side door was open. So they went over, or the passenger side door was open. So they go to the passenger side door. And um, you can't hear what they're saying, but, you know, this guy testifies that, you know, they ask him to come in and talk to his manager. Nope, we're not going to do that. So they leave, they go back in the store. The manager says, nope, you need to go back and ask him again. Tell, go back out there and ask again. So this time he goes back out there with a different coworker and um, same thing, they go up there, they ask him. And apparently the friend, you know, there's, there's three people in this vehicle. It's a Mercedes Benz, um, like an SUV, I guess. I don't know, or a truck. Anyway, there's no, it was an SUV. So George Floyd's in the passenger is in the driver's seat. The friend is in the passenger seat, and the ex-girlfriend is in the back seat. So apparently he was going to be giving them a ride home. So this, they they walk over to the passenger side again, and they ask that you know they apparently ask um, for him to come inside and talk to the manager. Nope, not going to do it. And they do tell him what it's about. Listen, you gave us a 20, counterfeit $20 bill. You know, we just want you to come in and pay for your cigarettes. Nope, not going to do it. In fact, so the passenger, <laughs> the store clerk recognizes the passenger as someone who had earlier tried to pass off a counterfeit $20 bill and he refused to take it. Um, so... <laughs> Now, this passenger tries to hand him a $20 bill, and he says, no, I, I'm, I'm not taking that. You know, I guess he was trying to pay for George Floyd's cigarettes. No, I'm not taking that. 
And so the guy tears it up, rips it in half, and throws it on the ground. And you can see um, the other, co his co-worker picking up the, the bill that was just torn in half. So unsuccessful, they go back in the store, they call the police. Um, let's see what else he testified to. Um, so it, the store closes at, he said the store closes at eight o'clock, but you know, this thing goes on past eight o'clock and you still see people going in and out of the store. Um, so he goes out, you know, cause he said, you know, at this point there's a commotion going on outside and, uh, there was no, pe nobody in the store. So he goes outside to see what's going on and uh, sees George Floyd, you know, laying on the ground with three officers holding him down. So he, he actually lives on top of the store with his mother. So he calls upstairs to his mother and he says, don't come down here. You know, there's, there's a commotion going on with the police and you know, you don't, you don't want to get involved. So of course, what do you think mom does? She comes down. <laughs> well, I would do the same thing. <laughs> Um, and the door that goes to the upstairs, like opens right to where this commotion is going on. So, but he, you know, so this coworker, he's watching the commotion and, um, he's trying to tell, um, the martial arts guy to calm down and, um, nobody's calming down. <laughs> um, and then he, he said he just became very emotional. He felt like, you know, he, he, you could see him, you know, holding, holding his head in his hands and just shaking his head. And they said, you know, what was going through your mind when you were doing that? And he said, you know, I was just so emotional. I thought, you know, if I, if I hadn't made a big deal out of this, this money, this wouldn't have happened. He wouldn't have died. And then he was, he couldn't work in the store anymore. He quit. Um, he said, I just didn't feel safe. That poor kid. I mean, he, and he was a kid, probably 18, 19. I think he was 19. Just, you know, there's been so many people like emotionally wrecked by what they saw that day. Anyway, um, so we now, we had a different witness who was a, he was a passerby. You know, as I was driving by and I saw an officer pointing a gun at someone um, in the driver's side of this vehicle. So I pulled over. He, he stopped right in back of the vehicle. Um, he had just dropped his wife off to go into Cup Foods to pick up some food. And so he parks behind George Floyd and he starts recording. So you can see these officers... Uh, go up to the vehicle and they both have guns drawn and um, then he stops recording because he says at that point I could hear sirens in the background and I didn't want to get caught in the middle of this so he starts his car and pulls pulls around to the other side um, to wait for his wife uh, resumes shooting video so now you can see the two officers um, have by now handcuffed him and are walking him over to the side of this building where this dragon walk, um, you know, Chinese food restaurant was. And they allow him to sit down handcuffed um, while they talk to um, the other passengers that were in the car. So, and that's really all he had, you know, his wife comes out with the food and they, um, he said he watched, um, he, he witnessed or filmed them and witnessed the two officers walking George Floyd across the street. Um, he said then when he pulled out to leave and he passed in front of the police car, you know, he took a right pass in front of the police car. Um, he could see that they were getting him into the vehicle and he thought, okay, everything's done with it's, you know, it's the getting him in the car. It's all over with, you know, little did he know. So that was his testimony. 
There was so much video of this, honest to God. Um, then the next person was this 61 year old black male who also was driving by and saw the officers trying to get George Floyd out of this car, out of his car. And they're like, why did you stop? And he goes, why do you, why do you think I stop? I'm nosy. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. I'm nosy, so I stopped. <laughs> and um, so he gets, I know, why am I laughing at this? But I just thought it was funny that he just, I'm nosy. Anyway, so uh, he gets out of his car and he is the person that you see in a lot of the video that's, encouraging George Floyd to just, you know, hey, just go with it, you know, give in, you know, you can't win, you're handcuffed, you know, just get in the car, you know, he follows them all the way around to where the police car is, where they're trying to get in, and he's telling George Floyd, you can't win, and he's actually having a conversation with George Floyd, and George Floyd is saying, I'm not trying to win, I'm claustrophobic, I can't get in this vehicle, and I just thought it was really strange. Um, so the whole time he's just, you know, talking to George Floyd. Um, so then they show him um, a video. It, 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 there was one point where you can actually, like he didn't know this guy, but at one point you can hear him actually saying, you know, you're going to have a heart attack. Calm down, you know, and um, I thought that was interesting. Um, but they showed him the video of, you know, him getting put to the ground and, you know, that whole scene. And this man just starts sobbing on the stand. I mean, literally sobbing. It was so gut-wrenching. So to the point where... <laughs> They had to take a break. The court went in recess. They had, they, you know, did like a 15 minute break, came back and then the guy was okay. And um, he said the reason he was so emotional is because he knew when the paramedics, paramedics arrived that George Floyd was dead and that it was over for him. And he just felt terrible. Um, about the whole situation. <sighs> wow. And, um, and that, but then, interestingly enough, body cam on Derek Chauvin, the defendant, caught conversation. He went over to, after this is all over, he goes up to the police car where Derek Chauvin is and has a conversation. Now, he testifies that he had met Derek Chauvin five days before in a different situation and had told him, listen, you know, you go home to your house safe at night and I trust you to send us home safe at night too. So that, so he kind of repeats himself. He goes up to Derek and he says the same thing. He goes, but you're a maggot. And then, um, you know, and you, you hear Derek saying, listen, this was a big guy and we had to control him and he may have been on drugs. And um, the guy just walks away. So, wow. Very interesting. Okay, then we get... Oh, this was really interesting. So, you know, they're playing the video of this... 61 year old man talking to Derek Chauvin and you can hear the dispatcher in the background sending the fire trucks to where the ambulance is at 31st and Park or whatever it is you know and to assist in the resuscitation so it was kind of haunting to hear that I'm like oh my god this you know and that which means you know the paramedics need help because somebody's got to drive the tr the rig while, you know, because they, two people can't resuscitate somebody, you know, if one is the driver. So um, they needed help. So they, 
they yeah so you could hear that on the dispatch and in, in the background of this conversation um that was kind of haunting anyway the next um witness is lieutenant james rugel who manages the business technology unit now i worked I probably never told you guys this. I've done everything. I worked as a police dispatcher. That's how I met my um, my ex-husband. Um, I was married to a police officer for 18 years. And, um, you know, back then, you, the police had a radio. And that was it. You, they had a radio. <laughs> and then I worked as a crime scene investigator. And that all I had was a radio. These guys got a computer, a radio, a body cam, you know, all this technology. So they came up with the idea of having this unit because now there's all these um, programs that, you know, the body cams run, you know, everyone is assigned a body cam, every officer. And then um, there's, he said, there's also these surveillance cameras strategically placed all over the city. So, you know, and placed in like high crime, high traffic areas. Um, so they needed a unit to kind of oversee all this stuff. Those cameras are on like a 14 day loop. So at any time someone can come in after the fact and say, can I, uh, can you pull between, you know, uh, this address between this time. And once they download that portion of the video, it goes to a special uh, program. It's given a file name, which includes the case number that they're requesting. It, it's very complicated technology now. I'm like, this is so cool. Um, so this guy was brought on the stand to, so they could bring in all, of, it was, he's a foundational witness, so they could bring in all the body cam videos of the four officers. So this is the point where we get to see all the body cam footage, which I thought was really super interesting. Um, they first showed Officer Lane. Now, I believe he's one of the four that's charged with murder. Um, he'll be tried later on. Um, he is one of the three men that were holding George Floyd down. So, but you can, at this point, between his body cam and the other guy, you know, there was Chauvin, Lane, and the other guy's name, I think, was King. Yeah, they're holding him down. And between King and Lane's body cam, you can really get a, get a good idea of what's happening in this inside this vehicle. So they start on one side of the vehicle and they're asking him to get just sit down and get in the car. <laughs> he wouldn't sit down. So they finally get him to sit down and they can't get his head. Um, you know, he keeps pulling his head out and they try to put his head back in. You know, they and they're they're like just you know could you just sit down you know his his feet are still in the street he just does not want to get in this car he's saying i'm claustrophobic you know can i just count to three um and then get in and um it was he's like um So what? So they. So another officer goes around to the other side, and they're there. You know, they're they were going to pull him, just you know, the rest of the way into the car. So George kind of like frog legs to the other side of the car. <laughs> he never sits down. He just kind of frog legs across the seat uh, to the other side of the car, where now this Lane guy is trying to pull him out. But then Chauvin comes in and takes over. And you can see Chauvin, like, put him in this neck hold, um, not for long, and it wasn't tight. But this entire inside of the car, George Floyd is saying, I can't breathe. 
Same as what he was saying on the ground. I can't breathe. Um, now, I, I suspect it was probably because he was having an anxiety attack. Um, you know, if he truly was claustrophobic. I don't know. So, uh, Lane's body cam video also shows, you know, them approaching him in the in their the initial approach to George Floyd in his vehicle and you see them you clearly see him tapping on jo the the door of the car with like a nightstick and they're saying show us your hands and literally they must have said that you know I'm exaggerating 20 times and George is not showing him the, his hands you know, but and George is like just all this gibberish, like he's saying, um, I'm gonna die. I can, you know, uh, he, he just he's just saying all this stuff that doesn't make sense. I've been shot before, just like this. Um, you know, I don't want to die, you know, and then he puts his hands on the steering wheel finally, and they're like, put your hands on your head, and they're, and they're very clearly instructing him how to get out of this vehicle, and he just won't do it, and they're just asking him over and over again, he won't do it, um, so the uh, second officer comes over, King, and they physically take him out of the vehicle and handcuff him. Um, and then he keeps falling down, you know, and they're like, just stand up. And he's like, oh, I'm trying. And it was just weird. The behavior was just weird. Um, it wasn't consistent with opioid use. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. It was just bizarre behavior. Um, so then they show Chauvin's body. Oh, one more thing with the other two, two guys' body cam. And this was something I was very interested in. Um, when the firefighter comes up and identifies herself and says, you know, let me take his pulse. Can, you know, can you get a pulse? Um, you do see the officers trying to get a pulse. And it's at this point that they call EMS code three. Now, I never hear them say he doesn't have a pulse, but they do check the pulse and they do, at this point, I think the ambulance was already on the way, code two, but at this point, they're like code three. So this leads me to believe he probably didn't have a pulse, um, but they were checking it. So, you know, and that was one thing I was curious about. Um, not Chauvin, but the other two guys. Uh, Chauvin never moves. He just keeps his, his and, and you can clearly hear um, Officer Lane more than one time saying, shouldn't we roll him onto his side? And Chauvin is saying, no, no, let's just keep him here. Just keep, let's just keep him down on the ground. They're like, okay. Um, so, um, which I thought was interesting because you know, the prosecution's contention is, you know, the standard is you, if you have somebody handcuffed on the ground, you roll them on their side. Um, and they didn't. So, um, so then you get to Chauvin's body cam. And they didn't show a lot of his footage because um, at the point that Chauvin gets involved is when um, George Floyd is in the, you know, crab crawling through the back of this vehicle and you can see Chauvin like he actually takes his hands the back of his neck like this and tries to pull him he, not for very long very brief but I thought whoa what is he doing um and and then there's like this all you know like because it's a body cam, so like you can't, you just see scuffling, you know, you don't really see anything. And then the body cam falls to the ground. So Chauvin loses his body cam. It falls all to the ground. So there's no more footage from Chauvin, which I thought was also very interesting. Um, and then um, just a little to wrap things up, um, 
you know, why did they put on the minors, which was something I wondered about yesterday. Why all these minors? Why would you put a nine-year-old on the stand? Well, here's why. In the state of um, Minnesota, where this is at, Minneapolis, um, there are very strict sentencing guidelines. And the guidelines say that... A judge can deviate from those sentencing guidelines upward, in other words, give them more time than they would, got, would have gotten if convicted, if there were minors present when this crime occurred. So they put on the minors to show that there were minors present and emotionally affected by what was going on. So that if Chauvin is convicted, the judge now has the... Um, the reasoning to give him more time than the sentencing guidelines would call for. How do you like those apples? Yeah. So let's talk, let's go back to April Fool's. Let's talk about April Fool's Day. So this is super funny. It's called the Great Spaghetti Host. Um, so in 1950, what was it? Fifty-seven, um, the BBC airs this um, news story about these spaghetti trees in Switzerland. <laughs> and you see the spaghetti hanging from the trees. And I will put a link to this video of the actual news story where <laughs> it's, it's so real looking. Like you, you, it makes you think that like, wow, there's spaghetti growing on those trees and they're harvesting it and they're laying it out to dry. And it's, and like the guy that narrates it is this famous newscaster. So it air, you know, it gave it a sense of, you know, reliability to the news story, but clearly it was all fake. There were people calling in to like, where can we get this spaghetti? You know. <laughs> Take a look at that video. Pretty funny. Um, I watched it. It's not a long video. Uh, it, these women, they're out there in their, you know, aprons and dresses and they're harvesting the spaghetti. <laughs> it's so funny. So another really funny hoax was Taco Bell announced um, in 1996 on April 1st that they had bought the Liberty Bell and they were renaming it to the Taco Liberty Bell. And... <laughs> The advertisement for them cost them $300,000, but they netted over a million dollars in profit from that April Fool's joke. Um, and then the White House press secretary, in response to public concerns, um, stated that the federal government was also going to be selling the Lincoln Memorial to Ford Motor Company and renaming it the Lincoln Mercury Memorial. That's funny. <laughs> it is. But not as funny as the spaghetti tree, but really funny. <laughs> so the Taco Liberty Bell and the spaghetti tree on April 1st. Oh, I don't want to go to work. No, guys. Okay, so last night I posted my video for the April yarn giveaway. Check it out. Uh, I'll try to put a link up here to that video. Um, lots of links today. <laughs> so there's a link up there to that video. And also, um, you, you don't, you're not going to want to miss it. It's got some great yarn in there. Um, so, and I'm also going to uh, publish my putting the chair together video. It's just a fun little video. Please do not take it seriously. It's not like the how to put, to put this chair together. Um, it's just how we did it. <laughs> That's all I want to say about that. And we had fun. So me and my friend are. So I will see you in tomorrow morning's morning show. Um, and I hope you guys have a great Thursday. Take care, everybody. Love you. Bye.